The session's going to have several parts to it. The first part, we're going to just define what an experience response is in extended reality. And um, we're going to then look at the inputs that are required to create an extended reality experience based on the realities that we want to work with, whether that's um, everyday reality, the reality of a person's imagination, um, whether it's the created reality or generated reality inside of a computer, 3D print, AR, VR, or um, that holographic reality or mixed reality. We're also going to look at the types of sensory uh, experiences that people are going to have uh, within the story and what senses are going to be involved, but also information related to not just physical senses, but uh, information from sensors as well, so sensory data. Last, we'll look at what kinds of interactions we're interested in having in the experience, whether they're just purely passive or they involve interactive responsive experiences or even shared ones across the internet. In the second part, we'll look at how to create grids that map the list of realities that we've chosen, the sensory channels, onto the interactive UI UX elements. And we're going to check that this aligns with the experience that we're looking to create, the experience response that we defined in the story that we're imagining for our experience. Part three, we'll look at how do we actually go about um, generating it and producing that experience by listing the assets that we're going to need, uh, what kind of software or hardware do we need, what kind of techniques are we going to use, and who is going to be needed in terms of roles um, and timetabling to get the job done. In part four, we're going to come back together and we're going to share the workflows that we've designed with one another. And we're going to get the teams to listen to each other's workflows and then ultimately compare and feed back on how they found their respective workflows. And to close, uh, we'll get some feedback collectively as a group and look at some uh, miscellaneous reflections and thoughts. And then we'll close the session. So let's begin and with a short introduction on trans reality storyboarding framework and um, just uh, have a refresher of what's involved. Uh, it involves three components. Um, the A realities design methodology, which looks at the different realities that people might want to work with, whether it's augmented or virtual reality, for example. It includes the pairs uh, methodology and framework, which is about the kinds of interactions that you want to utilize in the experience, whether they are passive or interactive or shared, for example. And lastly, what kind of sensory engagement is going to be involved from the physical senses, but also from sensory uh, data coming from sensors. All those three in their various kinds of mixes come together to create the framework. And the result is that a space will be created for a specific kind of experience. The first part, the eight realities uh, design methodology, looks at all the different realities that people typically want to work with in an extended reality experience, beginning from the everyday reality that we're familiar with, the physical world that we reach out and touch and that we share with other people. The next stage is about the reality of what we're thinking in our imagination and what we're dreaming up and designing. And that's usually followed by taking what's in our imagination and putting it out into the real world through some kind of captured reality where, for example, we might do an illustration or do a photograph or shoot a video or do a 3D scan. These are all examples of us capturing reality um, in some kind of way, either from our imagination or from everyday reality. Once that reality is captured, either as a drawing or something else, typically it might be taken into a computer for being processed. It might be turned into a 3D model, for example, or special effects might be applied. But this is a kind of uh, generated reality uh, within an electronic device, typically. So this reality is typically called a computer or electronic-aided reality. Once the uh, designs have been generated inside the computer, then they're going to probably be output in some kind of form. They could be output into 3D printed form. They could be output into an augmented reality experience. It could be output into a virtual reality experience or uh, a mixed or extended holographic reality experience that you might find, for example, in the Microsoft HoloLens. This is a hierarchy in that typically if you want to produce anything in any given reality, you are probably going to need all the components uh, that exist prior to it. So for example, 
uh, if you wanted to generate something in 3D printed reality, you are probably going to have to have uh, something that was created within the computer and maybe even scanned or captured through photog photography or a, a scan of some kind. Similarly, with virtual reality and extended reality, you're going to include elements from the earlier realities that uh, are not the output realities, but the ones that are um, to do with the incoming uh, ideas and views and generation inside the computer. So that's basically everything up from reality number one to reality number four, everyday reality to computer and electronic aided reality. You need to go through those in order to create content for the last four. The different realities I've mentioned already cover uh, the everyday, the imaginary, drawn and captured, as well as the computer aided and electronics generated realities and they ultimately output to 3D printed, augmented, virtual or extended holographic realities. So this is a summary slide showing what each of those realities is about and you should be able to read this in the notes that are going to get provided to you. The types of interactions that people are going to have in their experience are typically going to be one of uh, five different kinds. And uh, usually you'll find that the uh, experiences are a mix of these types of interactions. So the simplest one is where someone has a passive experience of what's going on. For example, they might be watching a video, but they're not interacting with it in any kind of way. Um, the next level up is an active type of engagement where someone, for example, pushes a button and it makes something happen in the experience in virtual reality or augmented reality, for example. Something that's interactive involves someone doing something and then the software application doing something back. So it's a form of exchange. So that's a, a kind of official, genuine, two-way interactive experience. It might involve uh, the application responding with information from uh, things such as sensors. And in that sense, the experience is generating responses uh, from various kinds of sources and not just the human being that's involved in the experience. Ultimately, the experience might be shared over the internet and people might, for example, be using a, a virtual reality headset to co-design a building or even share in something like a surgical experience. This will require the internet and networks in order for it to be able to be shared. So this is uh, what we typically call a shared experience or shared interaction. Together these five types of engagement um, spell out the, the letters for the PAIRS methodology, P-A-I-R-S. Now when we put together the realities uh, with the different senses, such as visual, auditory, haptic for example, um, wherever we are trying to create an experience to do with a particular sense, we're going to have some kind of interaction. So here's a grid showing how an augmented reality experience in uh, Microsoft HoloLens headset was created. But this augmented reality experience was accompanied by some 3D printed things that people could connect to as well. So overall, we worked with all of the realities in this particular project. This is the Leonardo project that was exhibited in London and in Italy and involved sharing ideas of Leonardo's on perpetual motion machines as 3D printed objects, as augmented reality experience and a holographic experience through the Microsoft HoloLens. So we definitely worked with imaginary elements to do with Leonardo, everyday things that are in the physical world in terms of the exhibition we worked with. We did a lot of capturing in terms of um, photography and 3D scanning and generated models that were also 3D printed and in integrated into augmented as well as virtual and holographic experiences. So we tended to create materials that we could see across all of those realities. So you can see the C column is completely occupied. Not everything involved um, audio or sound or hearing or listening to things. So 3D printed, for example, didn't have any sound associated with 3D printed models that we created. Um, but of course, um, it's something that was very much the case in the augmented reality experience, which had a voiceover, for example, which someone was speaking over and telling a story. There are also touch elements where people physically connected into real experiences in the exhibition that we created. 
and also in conjunction with the 3D printed machines that were generated. And hands were also used for uh, indicating gestures to activate various things inside the Microsoft uh, holographic uh, HoloLens experience. In, in another project, we did actually use more or less the same criteria um, where we were working with astronauts and we were taking in readings of temperature and heart rate and we were feeding that information into the holographic headset. So you can see at the end that we included sensors which uh, registered temperature and heart rate that was captured in, uh, from the everyday reality and ultimately it was something that was delivered and seen in the holographic Microsoft HoloLens uh, headset. So in this one picture, it's possible to see all the different realities we work with and experience, all the different sens sensations or senses we worked with, including sensory data from sensors as well. Now, wherever there's a tick, there's a requirement typically for some kind of interface. Um, so if we want to complete this experience, we would need to ensure that there were interfaces wherever a particular sense or sensory data channel engage with a particular reality. So one of the things that we did as a consequence of this was look at each of the ticks and decide, well, what kind of interface do we want here? So in the case of seeing something in augmented reality, you can see that we included the passive video of Leonardo da Vinci's machines in action showing how they worked. So somebody would just simply be watching that. They wouldn't be interacting with it in any kind of way. Um, but there was also the opportunity to use our voice for passing instructions in another project. Um, so under the here column and in virtual, you can see there's an active sound component where someone would give a voice instruction and that would lead to something changing in the scene. In the case of the holographic experience, hand gestures were used uh, to make things happen in the scene. So that technically falls under the touch column because we're getting people to use their hands and use their fingers to interact with what's actually going on. And that would be considered an interactive uh, hand gesture. Now, with the projects to do with the astronauts, we're monitoring their performance um, in the WeKit project and measuring their temperature. Um, we were including that data in the holographic uh, headset display. But we're also downloading training programs um, from the internet and also uploading them to the internet cloud so that they could be shared with other people so that they could use um, those uh, expertly produced uh, training guides for particular uh, work tasks. Now together, all of these things, the, the realities that have been chosen, the, the sensors and the sensory data that we're gonna work with and the corresponding interfaces and interactions that are gonna happen as a gestalt, they define the overall experience that we want the person to actually have who's gonna come and uh, engage with this. It'll define the response that person's gonna get by engaging with this particular experience. So this is the overview of what you've um, just been informed about. Uh, the trans reality model includes the eight reality design methodology, which covers the eight different realities that people typically wanna create XR experiences across. Um, it has specifications for the types of interactions that are gonna have uh, when people are engaged in those realities and specifically through which kinds of sensors or sensory data that's actually gonna happen. So all those three elements come together and those trans-reality storyboarding framework components ultimately lead to the creation of that experience space defined by how the realities connect with the senses and how those senses and realities connect through uh, interactions or interfaces that you see listed uh, by the black arrows at the bottom. So you can say that the trans-reality storyboarding framework, it's a matrix, um, storyboards, where storytelling realities, that's the rows in that grid that you see, are connected into by interactions. That's the uh, arrows that you're seeing coming out of the page of your the z-axis. And these act as the gateways for the sensory or sensor experiences and channels uh, that you see at the top on the horizontal. So this experience space is ultimately what we're trying to create. So we have to choose our realities, we have to choose our interactions, we have to choose the sensory engagement we are interested in. And once we've selected those uh, based on the story that we want to tell, we'll end up with an experience space that we need to go and generate and um, produce. So in 
part one of this tutorial, we're going to have a look at creating those inputs, creating a list of the realities that we want to work with for a project, what kind of sensors do we want to engage with, and what kind of interactions are we going to have in place for people to engage with the experience. The instructions for the breakout groups that you're going to go into involve you actually just listing what realities you want to work with in your particular project and experience, what sensors do you want to engage, and also what kinds of interactions do you want to put in in order for people to engage those realities through their senses. So this part was just literally just about making the lists that you uh, are interested in working with in terms of the realities, the sensory engagement, and also the types of interaction. The next part will involve actually taking those lists uh, that you've made and um, turning them into grids where you can create the kind of matrix that you saw earlier, the experience space. And we want to make sure that what we've created um, is something that matches up and aligns with the experience that we're aiming for, the experience response, and make sure that wherever a sensory channel meets a reality, that there is a user interface or UX element for that. If there isn't, then we've got to make sure that we add those. The way the grids are created is by, first of all, creating a grid for the realities against the senses. So the original image that you saw for the matrix, that's what that was. It was a list of realities vertically and a list of sensory channels horizontally. And we just wanted to know for each reality um, which senses we're going to be engaged with in that reality. The sensory interaction list is um, one where the senses are on the vertical and the interactions like the passive, active and interactive are on the horizontal. And what we want to see is for each sense, what kind of interactions do we want um, in our experience? And lastly, we want to look at interaction reality, have a list of the realities and um, see what kind of interactions do we want in each of those uh, realities. So it's really just combining the three factors of reality, sensory channels, interactions in three possible ways to get a full map and audit of everything that we want in our experience. Part three, um, you actually want to put what we've discovered in the grids into practice. So for that, we need some templates where we uh, clearly list all the things that are going to be needed for actual production of the experience. For this, we need a clear list of assets, like the files that we want to use with the objects and so on. We need to clearly identify what techniques are we going to do. Are we going to build meshes, 3D models? Are we going to have animation? Is someone going to record voices, for example? And lastly, we need to make have a clear list of who's going to do it, who's going to create those assets, what techniques are they going to use, and what roles are we going to have to have in the project, like a 3D model or a print technician or a Unity director, for example. Once we're clear about what assets we need, what techniques we're going to use, and who's going to do it, um, we can actually put that information into a typical project management uh, template or um, file. In the projects that you're going to be working with, there'll be a template that will help you list out the shots that you want in your experience in terms of the sequence of um, steps that make up your experience. That will be followed by a storyboard where you can take the list that you've created to clearly identify um, what senses and what interactions you want for a particular part of the experience. And then from the storyboard, you'll be able to produce the assets and uh, define the techniques you're going to use. And then the last thing that you'll see in that spreadsheet will be the project management sheet, which will identify when you begin each task, like the building of a particular asset, and um, when's it going to finish in terms of duration. And you also want to keep track of when it actually began and how long it actually took so the project manager can manage resources appropriately for the actual project. When all this is done, you're going to come back and you're going to share your workflows and your plans and templates with each other and just compare how uh, you actually uh, managed to do in terms of creating a workflow for your XR experience. So each team will share their workflow with another team, spend some time doing that, maybe 10 minutes. Then they'll swap, swap around and the other team will share what happened with their workflow. And then at the end, they can compare with one another and see 
what advantages there were to doing things in the way that they did uniquely within their own teams and what problems there were. At this point, the uh, session will finish and um, we'll just check in with everybody and ask for some closing comments and reflections and anything else that came up during the session.